frantic expression of grief. Assalamu alaikum again. Again, I'm going to start with um, just saying Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. I want to read slowly in Arabic an ayah from the Quran, which you've heard earlier when uh, Sheikh Hidli was speaking. So be patient with my pronunciation. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Ya ayyuhal nasu, inna khalaqnakum min dhakarin wa unta wa ja'alnakum shu'un wa qaba illa lita'arafu inna akramakum inda Allahi atqaqum inna Allaha alimun khabirun. Give me some encouragement. Alhamdulillah. This ayah is really profound. And when I was researching to speak to you today, when I was studying the words and the vocabulary, I realized there was so much depth in it. So I'll read the translation and then I want to talk about some of those words that I discovered. And honestly, I could talk the entire time just about these words. They're so profound. O oh, humankind, we created you from a single pair of male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know each other, not that you may despise each other. Verily, the most honored of you in the sight of Allah is the one who is the most righteous of you. And Allah has full knowledge and is well acquainted with all things. But I have a warning before I continue. This is technically a workshop. So we have to make them work. But I'm afraid that you won't be able to do a thing about this issue when you leave this lecture, except change your thinking. So first, let's look at this, these definitions in here, because they provide a really beautiful image of spiritual elevation and movement upwards towards higher levels of development. So the first one is to know, which here in the ayah is arafa. It means to know, to acquaint with, to perceive, to recognize, to discern. Now the other word in Arabic that we have that relates to knowing and knowledge is alima. And that is in contrast used to discuss distinct or special knowledge. And its opposite is jahila or ignorance. But the opposite of arafa is ankara, to deny. And when I'm looking at this in relation to this ayah, because these two sentences, sentences are together, know your communities, get to know humanity, and then after it comes this word arafa, meaning these are related. And how so? One of the most basic human desires is to be seen, to be known, to be acknowledged. And here Allah is using the word arafa, in asking you specifically to acquaint yourself and perceive and recognize and acknowledge. So, I have to tell you, being in the field of psychology, that if you were to deny people this, to ignore them, to give them this, to, to give them the cold shoulder and to pretend they're not there, you will lead to great sorrow and human tragedy. You do that in your mosques, and you do that to the youth, what's going to happen? Great suffering and great loss. So denying and not perceiving the other is a significant, a significant tragedy. Therefore, do perceive, do acknowledge, and don't deny. In a way, denying others is like spiritual de genocide. You're not going to the level of actually physically harming someone, but in a way, you're denying their humanity and you're committing a spiritual genocide by ignoring other cultures and other people and other races that come to your centers. Think about that. It's a spiritual genocide when you don't see the other and you don't acknowledge them and you don't seek to find out what's of value in that other that can benefit you, really. So, you know you've heard this word before, kafir. Kafir, it's used a lot in certain schools of thought. In the Wahhabi ideology, everybody who doesn't look like them is a kafir. It's a very strong and harsh use of the word. However, in the media today and in the public, this is what's picked up. This, this belief that the other is worthy of discarding and even killing. 
And so you'll see these small groups, but who have big voices, will come to various events like these conferences, and they'll hold up the most gory photographs you've ever seen, showing that Muslims are violent and, and willing to kill others who don't believe like them. And yet that's a small, small group doing that, but yet it will be magnified by the enemies of Islam. So don't allow that to happen. So remember to see the dignity of others. Then we go to the word, actually sorry, we stay on Arafah for a minute because what does that have also in it? When you are working towards having true knowledge in this manner, by Allah's definition, there is a connotation of elevated dignity with this word and distinguished position. So it's asking you to go to the highest levels of discernment. That means you don't brush off people and look at them superficially. It means you get to know at a deeper level. So this will give you elevation, this aspect of striving to understand the others, not loss. You will not lose yourself and your culture and your things that are precious to you by engaging in this command of Allah, in this ayah of Allah. So akramakum, it comes from karama. It means the most honored. And again, it has layers of meaning. It's actually a word that implies being productive, being actively generous beneficent, doing good, kindly in action and purpose, and gracious. How many of you like that word, gracious? How many of you met somebody who's gracious? Gracious. How many of you met somebody who's not gracious? Yes. Yes, and that, how does that feel? Not very good. It feels very dead, closed off, harmful. But someone who is gracious and generous, this is a word here, again, akramakum, it's a growth-oriented word. It implies in it that you are actually producing something better. There's an exponential growth. It's like a generating, life-giving spring. And again, it implies elevation. And then we have this word, inda, and used in conjunction with Allah. And it's translated as, in the sight of Allah. But again, we have more layers of meaning. It implies the notion of being close to Allah, a proximity to Allah, and high rank and dignity again. And then, atqaqum, most righteous, is how it's translated in the, uh, the ayah that I read for you. And it comes from the verb waqaya, and that means to protect, to save, to ward off, to guard against evil, calamity, and to be dutiful conscientious, or dutifully conscientious, meaning duty, you have an obligation to do something. And I think when we look at the beginning of this ayah, O oh humankind, we have created you from a single pair of male and female and made you into nations and tribes that you may know one another. Again, knowing arafa at another level that you are generating protection and goodness and being dutiful towards humanity and towards Allah by engaging in this, by looking to know and meet and understand and be interested in humanity. So, it's a rich ayah. It's really beautiful and I hope that I'm not doing any injustice to it, but I think by looking at this vocabulary, you can see that there is a lot to this work. It's not a simple thing to say, oh yeah, I like Indian food, I'm, I'm multicultural. Oh yeah, I can, I can say hello in Chinese. Ni hao ma, shi shi ne. All right, great. No, that's not what we're talking about. We gotta go beyond that. You have to learn and really seek to welcome and be interested in the other. And why is this important? Because I can tell you, as a convert to Islam, that I became a Muslim, as Brother um, Hanif shared with us, because I believe in Islam and the culture of Islam. And I believe that that was something that was going to unite me with other believers. But for years and years and years, that was not the case. Even though I kept at it, a little naive over here, I'm afraid, but I kept at it, trying to be a part of a community and serving others and being willing to participate. But what I was met with was not the same as what I offered. So much so that to the point where I no longer was able to muster the strength to do that. So what I'm saying is you're losing people in your centers because this lack of willingness to be truly welcoming 
and interested in others who are not the same as you in every aspect, but share your dean is really significant. And that has to change. But I told you, you can't really change it. Maybe you'll change your thinking at the end of this lecture, but hopefully that at least that will change. But you know, we have within the Muslim community an unwillingness to see the other, and we also have an unwillingness to see the other without, meaning outside of our Muslim communities. As you may have heard, Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany, she gave a speech in uh, October of 2010. She said, multiculturalism has failed. And I'm thinking, what a lie. Because that is the only truth of humanity. Look anywhere in the history of the world. Look at any country, anywhere in the cycle of time, and you will see that cultures and people and tribes have been flowing in and out of each other's space for millennia. There's no such thing as non-multiculturalism. It's the reality of all of us. How many of you know about National Geographic's Genome Project? Well, we participated in that. My mom sent in her sample, and we got back the results. Well, our heritage on my mother's side goes all the way across Europe. She was, uh, her family is from Croatia. She's first generation American. Goes all the way across Europe and down into the Middle East. And then when you go back even further, where does it go? Into, <coughs> oh, Africa. We all have multicultural in us throughout our history. And it's a false notion to think that it has failed. It is what makes humans rich. It's what makes life interesting. And on a biological level, it actually makes the human being stronger. The combining of different races. When you have a gene pool that is constantly intermarrying, you end up with lots of disease, right? So this connection of being interested and connected to other people and other cultures and other places is actually always to our benefit. Now, let me tell you something else. In the history of Islam, we have a period known as the Golden Age, the Islamic Golden Age. And here we find a group of Muslims who, over the period of 700 years, had immense connections across cultures, across languages, and across countries that produced some of the greatest scientific work ever known to man that are actually so significant that many of the things that we benefit from today would not even be here if it weren't for them. Europe would have never had the Renaissance, the Europe would have never had the, the changes that they had, and sciences would never have developed in the ways they have if the Muslims had decided that they didn't want to be interested in anybody who didn't look or sound like them. So what am I talking about? We're talking about scientists who translated the ancient texts of Greece and Rome and Egypt and Persia and Babylon, and they all were working with the desire to seek knowledge, taking the injunction from the Holy Prophet Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. To seek knowledge from the cradle to the grave, very seriously. And the other injunction, to seek knowledge, if you have to go all the way to China, they took it seriously, and they did just that. So we look at the biography of Abu al-Qasim al-Zahrawi. He was a renowned Muslim surgeon of the 10th century. And in a book on a biography about him by Fred Raman, he says, Islam in the first 500 years after Muhammad وسلم, was in many ways forward thinking, progressive, scientifically advanced. And he says, how was it that Muslims had a closer relationship with the greatest works of antiquity than the successors to the Roman Empire did? Why did Muslim territories produce so many intellectuals and scientists during a period when scientific advancements were declining in Europe? They did so because they believed in the guidance of, of Allah through the Holy Quran and the dignity of Islam, and they believed in the culture of Islam. And they didn't let any cultural barriers stop them. So who? What did he do, Abu al-Qasim, the physician and the father of modern surgery? He went outside his community by becoming one of the key transmitters and developers of the work of the ancient Greeks. And had he stuck to what he had only known within his community, humanity may have never benefited from his work to advance and develop these ideas. We might not have cataract surgery, or you might not be able to get your dislocated shoulder realigned. 
Or you might not even be able to have the bleeding stopped if you had to have surgery. These are all developments that he created, and they're a small amount compared to all he did. He wrote a 30-volume book that was called The Book for Those Who Can't Read Larger Books. Yeah. And the last one is on surgery in particular. Al-Biruni, one of my favorites, a Shia Muslim during this time period, also alive during the 900s and the early 10 hundreds. He was uh, an amazing polymath, and he lived and he worked in a great atmosphere of intellectual pursuits. He authored 180 books in every field of medieval learning, using the Quran as his standard, and working with the texts of the ancients as well. His method, research, observation, and reason to explain the unexplainable and reveal Allah's relationship to humankind always seeking to advance humankind's connections to Allah. He said, if you can ask a question and then another question, it's an indication of Allah's infinite entity, his, how he's just infinite. Because each question that you can ask shows that there's more to know, there's more to know, there's more to know. He was truly a moment, and he sought to understand so many topics. What did he study? He developed geometry, trigonometry, spherical trigonometry, and calculus as it related specifically to astronomy. Astronomy was significant for the Muslims at that time because of the need to know Qibla and the times of Salah. And he worked by working with a number of translators, so he spoke multiple languages. The groups of people who worked together were from a variety of places, coming together because they saw themselves as Come on, people. Workshop. Work a little. Muslims. That's right. They saw themselves as Muslims. They didn't see themselves as, I'm from uh, Qazvin, and I'm from Kharawizm, and I'm from Ray, and I'm from Baghdad. No, they didn't do that. They saw themselves as Muslims. He also worked with geography, natural sciences, and physics, and comparative religion and philosophy. One of the last books he wrote was extensive on the geography and the culture of India. He himself coming from uh, Kharawizm, which is technically under the Persian Empire at the time of his birth, so Persia claims him today, and uh, I think it's, um, is it Kazakhstan? No, Kyrgyzstan, one of the Stans, uh, claim him as well. <laughs> Nonetheless, he was part of the Muslim Ummah, so all the Muslims should be proud to claim him as one of them. Al-Biruni, Biruni for those of you who speak Farsi, what does that mean? Outsider, that was his nickname, but he really was an insider to Islam. So there are many, many more scholars worthy of mention, and the reason why, again, I pull from them is for you to see that they worked, again, in this very cosmopolitan, very multicultural environment, again, where Islam was the driving force, and they had tolerance collaboration, keen interest in discovery and learning were of paramount importance. Again, they spoke multiple languages and they did so much to advance knowledge for humanity. They weren't micro-specialists and they were interested in many things. So now, today in our masjids, when we look at the situation, I want to name two ailments that I see. One of them is called insider-outsider and the other one I'm going to call fear of infection. So let me tell you about insider-outsider. As I mentioned to you, I was part of a community for many years where I offered to support the youth and I worked very hard to try to create programming for them. And my motivation was, whenever I'd enter the masjid, I'd notice that no one would greet the youth. Everybody would walk by them like they weren't even there. So I started greeting them. And guess what? They liked that. And it, it built a connection. And from there, I was able to work on classes and activities and games and try to make the Eid special for them and meaningful, and also to try to bring things in English for them so that they could really make a connection. Alhamdulillah, whatever I did, I hope Allah is pleased with it and it benefited them. And I, but the opposition that I faced, oh, I've got to go to time out already? I'm getting into the meat of it. All right, I'll finish the diseases and then I'll head down to my seat. But the point is, the work was there, the opposition constantly came. The work was there. So never was I accepted as an insider of that place. I was always an outsider. Don't do that to the people who are working for your community, who are working for your youth. Don't do that to them. Make sure, 
you see them as an insider, not an outsider. Another thing I want to point out with the insider, outsider, is uh, this particular community that I was involved with for many years had a very rich and dynamic African-American community that was very involved. But with time, they were decimated because they were not included, they were not considered insiders, despite their tremendous commitment to, to the, you know, the revolution and all the changes they had made in their life to be Muslims, they were not considered insiders. And so the community at large has lost from what they have to offer as well. Finally, I went to another center more recently. This is the insider-outsider disease again. And I was, um, I think, the only white person there. And so what happened was one of the ladies of the mosque said to me, oh, we're so happy to see you here. It's very nice to have visitors like you. What do you think she thought I was? Outsider, Christian. She thought I was a visiting Christian. So don't look at somebody of another race or another color or another language as an outsider. They're your Muslim brother and sister. And make sure that you remember that and welcome them with an open heart. Fear of infection. Let me just mention this and I will close it up. When your Islam is strong, when your belief is strong, when you have trained your family and your children to understand that they are different, but it's good that they are different. When you have made sure that they have a solid identity, there's really no infection that can destroy that because Allah is their shield. However, what I see about, uh, inside the Muslim community is a tremendous fear of outsiders, anything that doesn't look, sound, or agree with me. And that's not the attitude we need to have. Just like the point that was mentioned, the person who gave our opening uh, introduction last night about the German who was very uh, negative towards Islam, but there was a, a sheikh or an imam who came to him and spoke to him and invited him. Had he not done it, this man would have totally never uh, changed his way. But because he was open and interested, there was a profound change. So don't look at others who are not like you, who are outside of Islam, as someone who can infect you. No, you are inoculated by Allah. So I will stop there, although I have more that I'd like to share with you. But don't be afraid to see the wisdom in others and the beauty in others who can, you can connect with the spiritual knowledge that Allah has given you. Let me share, share one small thing. I recently went to a writer's workshop. There, there was an author named Richard Bausch who shared with us a piece he had written on advice he'd given to young writers, new writers. And one of the things he mentioned I found to be particularly profound spiritually. He said, be willing, accepting failure as part of your destiny, learn to be willing to fail, to take the chances that often lead to failure in the hope that one of them might lead to something good. And then he said, be patient. You will write many more failures than successes. Say to yourself, I accept failure as a condition of this life, this work. I freely accept it as my destiny. Then go on and do the work. You never ask yourself anything beyond, did I work today? That is wonderful advice because we always may be striving to do something and it may seem a failure, which then may deter us from proceeding forward, but that is not the message of Allah because hope is the message of Allah. So you keep going and you ask yourself, did I work today, did I do my best? Is that not a beautiful message? Is that not like a reverberation of the message of Imam Hussein? Salawat. Allah.